Hey there, this is Pastor Don. I'm so excited you've decided today to watch with us from our Church on the Move experience in Glenpool, Oklahoma. This weekend, we're hearing from Pastor Ethan Vance. He's the lead pastor from our Broken Arrow campus, and it is awesome. Can't wait for you to see it. Jump in. Good Lord, we are so thankful. We're, God, we're so grateful that we can stand in this place, be reminded of your goodness, not because of what we have done. No matter how much we feel like we measure up or how much we feel like we've let ourselves or others down, we can stand in this place this morning and be reminded that your goodness is based on your grace. It's not something that we earn. It's not something we get because we measure up. It's not something that we accumulate over a lifetime. And eventually we're, 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 we're fine to walk into your presence and you're happy to see us, but your goodness toward us is based on who you are, on your character. And we can stand in this place this morning, shoulders back, head up, and receive the goodness of God because you love us. God, I pray that you would remind every single one of us that we are your sons and we are your daughters. We are loved, we are favored, we are graced with your presence, not because we are good, but because you are good. We receive it this morning. We thank you for your presence in this place. We love you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Come on, put your hands together. Let's fill this place with praise one more time before we're done. Hey, church on the move. It's good to see you this morning. Why don't you do this, do this, do this, do this. Hold on, hold on. I know that we're not touching, right? I get that. But do this, turn around, find somebody sitting around you, look them in the eyes, smile at them, say something nice to them, let them know they're seen and they're loved, and then have a seat for me. Well, it is great to see you this morning. Church on the Move South, come on, somebody. Hey, if... If I don't know you, I haven't met you, my name's Ethan. I am the lead pastor of Church on the Move, Broken Arrow. If you're new to all things Church on the Move, Church on the Move is actually six churches that meet all over the city and in our correctional facilities. And what that means is that you don't have one pastor. I don't know if you know this. You actually have a whole team of us uh, and, and our teams and everybody that works with us that love you and we're backing you up. Thank you, sir. Come on, give Brent a big hand this morning. I would have nothing to say if he didn't bring this up here. I'm just kidding. Anybody that knows me knows that's a lie. Uh, but you don't have one pastor. You actually have a whole team of us. And so I bring you greetings from Broken Arrow. Uh, but man, I just want to tell you, uh, number one, why I'm here this morning. I'm taking over. I'm kidding. Um, so uh, this is sort of a bittersweet uh, weekend for us. Uh, one of our longtime friends, uh, a gal named Fern Young, uh, passed away suddenly and somewhat unexpectedly. And why that matters to you and why you should care is Fern is the mother-in-law of our founding pastor, Willie George. And she passed away. She went to be with the Lord and her amazing husband and her family that went before her. And she was ready, gang. She was, she was ready to be with them and be with Jesus. If there was anybody I've ever heard talked about being in the presence of the Lord and just ready to go home, it was Fern Young. And, and uh, so she passed away. So the entire George family uh, is now in Canadian, Texas, and they are uh, celebrating the life of Fern Young. And so um, we just kind of said, hey, this is a perfect opportunity for us to uh, set in motion exactly what we've been saying. We kind of had to put the whole thing on hold because of this little thing called COVID. I don't know if you've heard of it. If you haven't, look it up. Um, uh, kind of put everything on hold, but we've just said, hey, we are um, one big church family and we're all in this together. And so uh, you guys have a really special place in my heart. Um, gosh, I don't know, what is it, seven, eight years ago now, uh, my wife Sarah and I actually helped launch this church before we went on to a bunch of other stuff. And uh, it's just been our journey. I don't know why, but that's been the case. So, um, so it has a soft place in our heart. But before you clap for me, that's not, I, I mean, I like you clapping for me. That's great. Anytime you want to do that. But I really just wanted, I, I know that Gabe and Summer uh, will listen to this message and, and watch this back probably on their way home um, from Texas. And so I think it is altogether fitting and appropriate that we pray for them and their family uh, and just let them know that we're, we're, we're with them in their grief and in their celebration of life. Would you join me? Lord, we are grateful for... Uh, the life of Fern Young, those of us that don't even know her, have been shaped by her in one way or another because Church on the Move has touched our life. And she's been a big part of that with her influence, her, 
her example, her prayer, uh, and her sometimes silent leadership. We celebrate her life. Thank you for the lives that she's touched. And we ask that you would give comfort uh, to the entire George family as they're grieving and celebrating. Would it be a time where even in the middle of the moments when it feels so final that they would be reminded of first the great things that she brought into their life, but second, the promise of eternity together with her because of Jesus. And we thank you for that. We don't grieve as those who have no hope, but we encourage each other with these words. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Hey, uh, just uh, for the sake of, um, you know, being my, my kind of my, my adopted brother, uh, would you just put your hands together and let Gabe and Summer know we love you guys, we care about you. And wherever you are right now, we're proud of you. We love you. Okay. So... Those of you that are maybe new this morning and you're clapping for some guy you've never seen, you're like, this is, a, this is confusing. Uh, this is just our family, and we just adapt and overcome. That's what families do, and so uh, we're glad you're here. So over the last um, several weeks, we've been talking about the idea of unity, and it doesn't take long to look around and realize that we live in a world that's more divided over more things than ever before. Uh, you can you know, be on Facebook for about three seconds and see comments for and against the same exact thing. And many times as believers, it can be easy when we both have a spirit of righteousness because we feel like we should stand up for certain things and a spirit of grace because we feel like we're supposed to be a, a salt and light and influence to other people. We can feel a little bit like a rope and a tug of war. When do I stand up and when do I uh, you know, show grace? And, and, and so this entire series has been uh, our hope is that you would hear the heart of God for his people to be an example of unity uh, in a world that's divided, that our, our families, our homes, our relationships, our marriages, our relationships with our kids and our friends, they can be different. They can stand apart. We can live in a different reality even when the world uh, is, is just ferocious and antagonistic and attacking each other. And so uh, today I just want to talk about the power of our words. Our words are sort of the invisible um, bond of every relationship that we have. And uh, in... Uh, the early um, uh, morning hours of 1945, on August 6th, the sky lit up over Hiroshima, Japan, and the definition of power in our world forever changed. It was an airplane, a, a B-29 bomber called the Flying Fortress that had flown over Japan, and Robert Lewis, the pilot, and his team dropped an atomic bomb that would eventually help end the, the war, but as he dropped it, and as he flew away, something incredible happened. There was a obviously horrific explosion. This explosion was the first of its kind, and it completely decimated a city, it took thousands of lives. It destroyed structures, burned down entire families and futures. It destroyed everything that it touched. It put up a mushroom cloud that was estimated to be 30,000 feet in the air, and as they flew away, Robert Lewis said these famous words, what have we just done? And it said that the cockpit flew back in silence from those words on. Can you imagine being the one that was responsible for that? On one hand, feeling like it was demanded of our world that we put an end to this. On the other hand, unleashing that kind of power. Just six years later, uh, the sky over Idaho lit up with the exact same power. Only this time there was no explosion, there was no mushroom cloud, there was no melted uh, sand turned to glass, buildings weren't destroyed. This time, homes lit up. This time, an entire city flipped the switch on the first ever nuclear power plant. And the same exact power with a slight, slightly different arrangement went from destroying a city to warming a city, went from burning it down to lighting it, it up. This one small thing, this one small discovery, this idea of atomic energy changed the world forever. And harnessed one way it brought destruction, harnessed another way it brought healing and hope. In fact, today, it's about a fifth of our electricity comes still from nuclear energy. And this is a great picture of your words. Your words and my words by themselves seem small, they seem insignificant to the size of damage or good that they can do, just like this bomb sitting in a small package in the back of an airplane may not have seemed like it was enough to set so many futures in motion and change the trajectory of an entire world, but it was all there in that little package. Your words, this is what James says in James chapter 3, your words carry that kind of power to build up or tear down, to lift or to rip apart. 
They're the atomic energy of relationships. You probably figured this out if you've ever had something that you've said and you wish you could take it back. If you've said something that you wish you could reel back in, but you just, you can't get it back and it's, the damage is already done. This is why James unpacks this in James chapter three, verse, starting in verse two, he says this. He says, we all stumble in many ways. If you have a pen, if you're taking notes, circle that word all. That's, it may seem like bad news. That's actually great news. James is saying that this is not something that all of us deal with or some of us deal with. This is something that all of us deal with. So if you have a place in your life as we talk today, maybe that the Holy Spirit or God deals with you today on that, just give yourself lots of grace. Welcome to the human race. We all deal with this. He says, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses, he uses as, as an example, it makes them obey us. We can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although, although they're so large and driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it, make, it makes great boasts. Consider a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil. Among the parts of the body, it corrupts the whole body, sets the course of one's life on fire, and it itself is set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, verse 9 says, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth, Come praising and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the spring, same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt, can a salt spring produce fresh water. James says, your words are incredibly powerful. Your words have the power to tear, tear down. Your, your words have the power to lift up. And from the very first page of the Bible, in fact, the, the entire story is only one chapter old. And into nothing, what does God do? He speaks. When God speaks, everything that there is comes into being. And God did this. God could have blinked and the worlds would have been made. God could have snapped. God could have jumped up and down three times and said a funny word. But what he decided to do was to set an example for you and me that we could follow being made in his image. He spoke and the worlds were formed. And then he turns to Adam and he does something interesting. He says, I want you to follow the pattern that I've started and I want you to start bringing order to the world first by naming the animals. In other words, he gives Adam the, the very first job is with his mouth mouth, not his hands. The very first thing that he turns to Adam, he says, I want you to bring order out of chaos, and you're going to do this with your words. And from the very beginning of the story of people following God, we see that our words shape worlds. This is what our words do. Our words have that kind of power to uh, bring order out of chaos, to, uh, to allow um, you know, things in our life both to be um, built up and to be torn down. So if you're taking notes, write this down. Number one, my words are powerful. My words are powerful. And right under that, just write this. My words shape worlds. What worlds do your words shape? Well, the first world that your words shape is you. You have been shaped from the time you were born by words. Words spoken over you, words said about you. And you know this is true if you think back on your life to things that were said that were hurtful toward you. Anytime we sit down in counseling with somebody, almost inevitably, the pain and the hurt can be traced back to one very small atomic bomb that was dropped in their life. Not always, sometimes it's a pattern, sometimes it's a, it's, it's a longer course of things, but very often something uh, that was set in motion by a, a seemingly innocuous statement by a parent or a friend sets in motion a chain of events where people try to chase down changing that thing that was said about them. You're not like your brother. Why can't you be more like this? You always seem to do this. You never seem to do that. If you've ever had that spoken into your world, you know how cutting it can be. Maybe it was something said by a friend that was really, in their mind, just meant to make everybody else laugh, but it cuts you to the heart and it created a, a piece of image in you that you see when you look in the mirror. Maybe you don't hear those exact words refraining and ringing over and over again, but you hear a piece of it. 
Maybe it was the last words a boss spoke to you before they fired you, and it's, 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 it's made an image of you. But the same thing that happens negatively also happens positively. Many of us can point back in our life to something that was said over us by a coach or a teacher. Maybe when we didn't feel like we were doing a good enough job and they called out of us a little piece of the potential that God had hardwired in us. And because of what they said, it made, it made us feel like, you know what, I think maybe more is possible in me. Your words shape you. I have a friend who, uh, she didn't grow up in a great family. She didn't grow up with a great role model uh, of parenting. And she really struggled with her image of being a mom because she felt like uh, there was this sort of uh, thing always over her where she always felt the lie, not of another person, but of the enemy spoken in her mind. And it was a script that she just let play over and over again. You're not doing it right. And she never knew how to do it right because she never had a great model to do it right. So she always felt like she was doing it wrong until one day an older mom that she really, really respected was over at their house and they were, they were working on some stuff and they were cleaning up kind of after a party. And this older, this older gal, a role model and mentor in her life, simply said these words. This was all she said. She had watched her with her kids and with the other kids. She said, you're a really great mom. She said, I, I dropped everything. I went in the bathroom, I locked the door and bawled my eyes out. She said, those, what is that? You're a really great mom. Five words changed everything about it. Set her free. One atomic bomb dropped into her life for good. She unshackled the chains and the shame that she had felt over what she had been uh, struggling with for so long because this person that had influence and perspective changed the way she saw herself. Words shape you. And before your words can shape anything outside of you, you have to understand what they're shaping inside of you first. What's the script that you hear played? What's the, what's the tape recorder that plays in your mind when you get up in the morning? When something feels like it falters a little bit and maybe it's not going to work out, it feels like maybe it's going the wrong way, what's the automatic thing that you begin to think about yourself and about life? It's not going to work out. I'm, here we go again. I, you know, we've had the failure. This is a cycle. I'm going to lose this job. He's going to leave. She's not going to like this. What's the thing that plays in your mind? Because those words are shaping you. From the very beginning, God wants us to understand how powerful our words are because they start by shaping us, but then second, our words shape others. In the same way that those words shape the way we see ourselves and the way we act, and the, the same is true for the things that come out of your mouth into the lives of other people. They shape the image, they shape the decisions, they shape the environment and the atmosphere of your world. When God spoke into our world, there were things that grew. First out of seeds and then into plants. Animals that started small grew large. Your words are very much like that spoken into your world. They create an environment. What environment are your words creating in your home? What environment are your words creating with a spouse, with friends? Your words are shaping something. Your words are very, very Powerful. In fact, in 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, Peter, uh, he says this, I, I love this, he says, he says, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. I love, he says, whoever desires to love life and see good days, he could have finished that sentence any way he wanted. If you want to love life, love God. If you want to love life, you know, do it, serve people. If you want to love life, memorize the Bible. He says, you know what? If you want to love life, get a hold of this. If you, can, if you want to have a good life and build good things, you're going to have to learn to control this because it is shaping everything outside of you. Amen. What are the seeds that you're planting? And if you really believe that the words you spoke were like seeds planted in the ground, what are they going to grow up into eventually? If you believe that your words were shaping your kids like a seed planted into the ground, what would you go home today and say to your kids? If you, believed your, if you really believed what God's word says, if you believe that your words are shaping people, what would you say to them? You're a really good mom. You're a really good husband. You're a, what would you say if you believed it was shaped? And, and what would it change about that little two-second filter between your brain and your mouth before those things start coming out. What 
Would it change? The second thing that James tells us is uh, outside of our words just being powerful, he said you have to understand that your words may be small, but they're determining your direction. Look at what uh, verse, verses uh, two and four say. He says, he says not only, not only uh, you know, are, they, are they creating something and shaping something, but he says, uh, if, you're, if, you're never, if, if anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, that's a, that's a, that, is a fun, that is an unbelievable statement if you think about it. So if I, just, if I can just control my words, everything about the direction I'm headed can be corrected. No matter how off it seems now, no matter how d- dire the circumstances or dark the future seems, no matter what I'm looking at with my finances, my job, even in a world that seems completely full of chaos, think, some, think about what James is saying. If you get your words right, everything about your direction can be different. Everything about your direction can be different. This is a picture of a, 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 the largest cruise ship in the world. This is the Symphony of the Seas. Uh, any cruise people in here, you like to go on cruises. Uh, uh, a couple of you, everybody else is like, not with COVID, not anymore, not a chance. We're not gonna do it. I'm not a cruise person. My wife comes from a cruise family. My wife comes from a very uh, aquatic family. They love this. Being stuck on a floating cage is just not my idea of a great time. But those of you that like that, um, my wife and I have never done it, mostly because I like to win. So. We've never done it. This is a symphony of the sea. Listen, listen, to, listen to these stats. This, this ship uh, can hold uh, 6,680 passengers plus 2,200 crews. So that's, what, 8,880 people. That is a ton of people. It has four pools, a water park, a basketball court, an ice skating rink, a zip line that's 10 decks high, a Broadway-style theater that can seat 1,400 people, an, aquatic, an outdoor aquatic amphitheater with Olympic height platforms, two 43-foot rock climbing walls, and there's a park that contains 20,000 tropical plants, and for those of you that care, it even has two robot bartenders. Absolutely unbelievable uh, feat of modern engineering. But as massive as that is, it's still a ship that's still steered by one rudder. One little cat. Doesn't they, they don't have a steering wheel anymore. I found that out the hard way. They don't have a steering wheel, which is really kind of disappointing. I picture the guy on the deck, and he's spinning the wheel to get away from the iceberg. It's a little joystick now. That's all it is, a little joystick that steers the rudder that determines the course of the entire ship. And this is what James is saying to you and me. I don't know how big what you're facing is. I don't know how far it feels like from where you are to where you want to be, but James says the way you're going to get there is not by hoping, not by wishing, but by understanding that your words are either taking you closer to that destination or pushing you further away. Your words determine your direction. Now, it's important to understand that as we read through the Bible, that God cares about everything that you say because where your words lead, your life follows. Whatever you're leading with with your words eventually will become the reality of your life. Now this is not, don't, make, don't, don't mistake this for a magical formula. You say, okay, so Ethan, what are, the, what are the exact right words in the exact right order so that I can get the exact right results in my life? God cares about your words, but can I tell you this? Especially as believers, a couple of important notes. Number one, God cares about all your words, not just some of your words. I know Christian, wonderful Christian families that have a great confession when you're around them. They, if you ask them how they're doing, they're going to say blessed and highly favored, right? They're going to say all the right Christian things to say, but yet they fight like cats and dogs in their, in their relationships and their family. God doesn't just care about the words you say in prayer or the words you say when you're confessing scripture. God cares about every word that comes out of your mouth. It's not like when we say amen, God stops listening. And he just doesn't, he, that, that's all I cared about. You got the prayer right, now I don't care about it. In fact, as we read through the New Testament especially, almost everything that the New Testament tells us about our words is about the words we speak to each other, not the words we speak to God. God cares very deeply about the words we say about ourselves and about others. Can I tell you this? Even written words are still words. Meaning, the words you comment, the words you post, the words you blog, the words you text, 
What's coming out of you doesn't get a uh, free pass because it is written in black and white. And in fact, I think that our words that we write in, in our current culture maybe are more powerful than the words we say because the words that we say disappear and only remain on human hearts. The words that we write can be read as long as they're out there. Whatever comment you post, whatever thing uh, you, you put out there, those things stay and they have a, an afterlife that lives on and expounds long after you've, you've put them out there. And I think as believers, we ought to be leading the way in being very thoughtful and careful about the worlds we are shaping by the words we are posting. Amen. And can I tell you this? That is exactly the same for words that other people say. We don't get a free pass as Christians just because we're throwing somebody else's brick. Say, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't say it, I just repeated it. This is something they said. Listen, if you're relaying it, you're saying it. It doesn't, you don't get a free pass just because it's somebody else's opinion. Be very thoughtful about what you post because your words are determining the direction of your life. Amen. The third thing James tells us is that our words can build up or tear down. Our words are not um, powerful in and of themselves, just like atomic energy, just like money, uh, just like many other things. Your words are neutral until you use them. This is a box full of a very familiar, probably slightly painful toy to many of you. How many of you have stepped on Legos at about two o'clock in the morning and yelled your kids' names under your breath? Oh, man! Right, that's me. Okay, so this is a box of very unorganized Legos that I grabbed this morning on the way out the door. Um, and here's a couple of different pieces of those Legos. Now these by themselves aren't anything yet, right? What happens with a Lego set? You get a Lego set, you wonder why you got into the parenting business when you dump them all out and your kid wants to spend the next two hours building this and you go, okay, son, here we go, circle up. We're gonna build, you know, the Star Wars Death Star, yay. So, <laughs> I'm kidding, I love I loved doing that with my, my sons because um, my words are shaping my world, okay? <laughs> So you gather, up, you gather up the Legos, and what do you do? You have an instruction book, and the instruction book tells you step by step to get from where you are to where you want to be. By themselves, they're nothing yet. You can make whatever you want out of them. These are very much like your words. Your words are building blocks. You pick what they build. Your words can build walls, or they can build bridges. If you want to have unity... And if as followers of Jesus, we're going to be a countercultural example of unity, then I have to make a very self-sacrificing decision. And this is where I think maybe for you and I, especially those of you maybe that are in a generation ahead of me, I think this is very, very difficult in America today. Because it feels like fewer and fewer people are calling out righteousness. Fewer and fewer people are calling wrong, wrong, and right, right. And there's a righteous indignation that I think is altogether fitting and, and good for us to have. But at what point do I make the determination and say, God, I'm going to choose to use my words to build bridges and not walls. I'm going to use my words to connect people together, to draw people in, to be salt and light, and to trust that you're going to do the work of changing hearts and changing communities. And if a group of people like you and I can bring people together with our words, I believe God can do amazing things if we'll trust him enough not to isolate ourselves, not to pull ourselves back, not to build walls, not to be antagonistic, but to build bridges. Our words can tear down relationships, and you need to know this. Your words, maybe more than anything else, can cause irreparable damage to relationships that we desperately want to be close and to be tight. This is what Proverbs says. It says, kind words bring life, but cruel words crush the spirit. Can I just tell you this? In your family, in your marriage, in your house, at work, with your team, with your boss, Whoever it is, anybody you share the currency of words with on a regular basis, it's not fair, but it's true. Negative words weigh more. The words that we speak that are negative, this is why um, if you go on Rotten Tomatoes and you're, you're looking for a movie and they, you know, they, they rank movies and they tell you what movies are, are, the critics think are good, it takes... Uh, there, there's a calculation that they have, and I don't remember the exact equation, but it takes far more positive reviews 
to outweigh one negative review to get that Rotten Tomato meter to go toward positive. It's just like your credit score. You can be doing good, 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 good. What happens? You forget that one thing. You do the one thing wrong. The wrong person gets a hold of your identity. Ding. It goes down to a 220 and everybody's freaking out. Why? Because negative weighs more. I think it was Jonathan Swift that first said uh, the, uh, a lie can travel halfway around the world before the, tr- the truth gets its boots on. And this is the way negative things work in our life. One negative thing, in fact, psychology tells us that it takes your brain about 15 seconds before you actually believe something positive, whether it's something good in the world or something about yourself. If I were to tell you, hey, I'm buying your lunch today, it takes your brain to process about 15 seconds before you even entertain the idea of that being true. Why? I think because we've been let down by lots of people. They've told us something and they haven't followed through. Whatever that is, we don't believe positive things for a while. We, we have to process it and go, I don't know about that. Are you, are you, are you, are you making this up? Are you really going to buy my lunch? I'm not sure. We, we're, we're skeptical. You know how long it takes the human brain to believe something negative? 0.00 seconds. You believe it immediately. I'm not buying your lunch. Of course you're not. You never buy my lunch. Every time, I, every time you promise to buy my lunch, you don't buy my lunch. We believe bad news immediately. And can I tell you, in your world and in your relationships, in the heat of the moment, well-meaning people, wonderful husbands, wonderful dads can walk in after having a horrible day at work and drop an atomic bomb on their home that can take days and weeks to put out the fires from. Your negative words weigh more. So weigh your negative words more before you speak them. Take time. Say, listen, I, I, I can say this, but I can't get it back. Do I really want to put, is this really what I want to put into the lives of the people that I care about? One of my great mentors, we were walking into a church meeting. I was visiting his church and we were talking about uh, stuff and he was going into a meeting and he invited me to come and he was gonna deal with a group of young people in his church that had been, uh, they, they discovered they had been over at a friend's house. They threw kind of a little bit of a wild party. They, there was alcohol there. Most of them were underage and he was livid. This was a board member's house and the board member wasn't home. And they threw this party. The board member came home to beer bottles and alcohol all over the place. And he was livid privately. And he said, Ethan, he said, this is something that I've learned years ago. He's walking up to the door. We're about to walk in the room where they're all sitting. And he said, I've just learned that if I'll pause right here when I put my hand on the doorknob, and I'll just ask this, I'll I'll just ask myself this question. Who do I want to be when I walk in this room? He said, everything in my flesh right now wants to be the guy that gets to read the riot act and tell them how they're all going to hell and they're all stupid and they're never going to measure up. My generation wouldn't have done it. You guys are, and he said, but I've just remembered how many stupid things I've done. He said, so when I walk in this room, I'm going to be a dad pulling his kids in for a talk. We're going to get this right, but I'm going to set them on fire for their future that can look different than the mistakes of their past. So he opens the door and he gave one of the best pep talks. I said, man, I'm never messing up again in my life. I can do better. Let's go. And I wasn't even the one getting the pep talk. You get to decide who you're going to be. Weigh your negative words more before you unleash them on the world. And some of us, you go, oh, Ethan, that's just, you know, that's just me. That's just how I am. I'm just blunt. As a follower of Jesus, we don't get that luxury. We are called to a higher standard where we weigh our words more. This is what James says in uh, chapter 3. He says, consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. If you've ever been around a forest fire, my wife and I lived in California uh, for a while, and there's, uh, while we were there, about 30 miles from where we lived, there was a, the largest forest fire uh, in California history while we were there. It's called the Camp Fire, and not the Camp Fire like you warm your hands at, not, not the good Camp Fire, the evil, horrible Camp Fire. It destroyed hundreds of thousands of acres and structures, took lives, destroyed homes. And this is one of the famous pictures out of the Camp Fire. The Camp Fire took months and months to put out. Firefighters from five different states were flown in. Airplanes with dirt and water and chemicals flying over, trying to put this thing out. And it was all started by one careless camper. And that one little spark set everything on fire. Your words are like a match 
but they're not a match just thrown into an ashtray. Your words are matches thrown on dry wood and dry leaves. Most people around you are desperate. This is why this is why Paul talks to husbands and he says, I want you to wash your spouse, your wife, with the water of the word. Why? Because most people are dry ground, desperate for water to be poured on them. Desperate for a good word to be spoken. Can you, listen, it is, never before in our history, in our country, have there been so many people hurting and looking for good news. And we're people that carry inherently in us good news of God's grace, and we get to bring it to people, but your words can shoot one small spark into somebody's life. And we know fire is powerful. If I had a match today and I were to walk down here, I light the match, and I get over here next to Lori's hair, do you think Lori's just going to sit there? You think Lori's going to go, oh, cool, let's see what happens. No, it's a small little flame, but she knows that gets near the wrong thing around the wrong person that has the wrong amount of hairspray on, poof, right? The whole thing goes up. Why? It's small, but it's powerful. And over and over again, James gives us this picture. Why does he give us so many pictures? Because we don't get it easily and we fly off the handle and we let our words out into the world and we don't genuinely think that they're going to make an impact. And James says, Be careful because your words tear down relationships. But on the opposite side, the good news is our words words can heal relationships. Our words can heal relationships. No matter how big the rift is now, the thing that we put in the gap between you and them, the thing that I put in the gap between you and me, when I don't know how it's going to work out and I feel like there's been so much distance, you know what I put in that gap? Words. Words heal relationships. My parents went through a really difficult stretch when I was growing up. They eventually uh, split, and uh, my mom went through several difficult relationships after that. Not really any fault of her own. She's an amazing, wonderful woman, role model of my life. She's, She's absolutely amazing. But during that season, it was very difficult for me to be around her. And as you, I'm sure, have experienced in your life, there were things that were said in that relationship that were hurtful. And Some of the things that I said were very blunt and direct about the decisions that she was making. I felt like the grown-up. I felt like she was the child. And I said things to her that were very hurtful. But you know what eventually healed that relationship after my mom and I had not really spoken other than a few text messages that my wife told me to send on Mother's Day and her birthday? Like, you better say something to your mom or you're never going to forgive yourself. Eventually, I picked up the phone and I just said this, Mom, can we talk? And without expectation of her taking any step toward me, I just started to fill the gap with my words. And my wife is amazing at this. If you know Sarah, you know the kind of person that she is. And she just began over and over again to encourage me, just tell your mom what you love about her. Don't fix it. Don't try to change her. Don't try to tell her how, just what do you, if you, if she was passing away right now and you were beside her bed in the hospital, what would you say to her? What would you thank her for? And I just started to do that. And today my mom and I have an absolutely amazing relationship again. Why? Because words heal relationships. So James says, speak life quicker. Be slower to speak what's negative, but speak life quicker. If you see something good in somebody, call it out. We tend to go so long in our relationships, especially in Oklahoma, especially in America, we tend to be pioneers that are like, if you're good, I'm good, we're good, okay, let's go. And we forget, man, maybe, maybe Scott just needs to know what I'm thinking in my head, which is you did did a great job this morning. You guys are gifted communicators. I'm thrilled that you're a part of our church. When you speak life to somebody, what happens? Their shoulders go back and their head goes up and they go, that's right, okay, so somebody else saw that. I wasn't making that up. Like, I'm not being cocky thinking I'm good. Like, good, okay. I, you know what I've discovered? Nobody in my entire life has ever said, whoa, 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 too much. Too much affirmation. Too much that don't, that's enough. Listen, we gotta talk about your thankfulness for a second. We gotta talk about your compliments for a second. We gotta talk about what you're saying to me for a second. And most people in your life, you take things for granted that they wonder what you think about them. You take for granted that, that, you, uh, that, you, that you appreciate them as a mom. They take for granted. <clears throat> you take for granted. That's, um, that's the Holy Spirit telling me I'm done. I'm kidding. I only have an hour left. Um, you take for granted what they do for you every single day, and you take for granted how you feel about it, meaning... 
I know Stephen Arruda. Stephen Arruda is a great friend. I love being around Stephen. Stephen's done amazing things for our church over the years. The stuff he's built, the infrastructure he's, he's provided, absolutely unbelievable what he's sown into our church over the years. I can take Stephen for granted very, very easily because I get all the good from Stephen, right? So I'm accumulating all this good from Stephen, and I can take it for granted. And I can go, oh, that's just Stephen. That's just that's what he does. He's never not been that. He's always been good. He's always been good to our church. He's always been good to my family. He's always had something nice to say when I've seen him. But if I don't turn around and thank him for that, all he's left with is wondering, what does Ethan think about me? I, on the other hand, what's my view of the relationship? Unicorns, butterflies, angels, harps, rainbows. It's wonderful. What's his view of the relationship? A big question mark. I don't know how we're doing. Why? Because he's giving good. He's doing good. Good things are happening. And I'm never saying anything back to him about that. So one of the most powerful things that you can do in your life is to, when you feel something good, say something good. Thank you for making that. Thank you for doing that. I saw that you did that. You know what I've learned with my boys? My boys never quite, and they're not here so I can say this, my boys never quite get to the finish lines. You know how that is with kids? It's like, we talked about this and we did all this and we, we, we're training and we're, we're saying, this is where we're going to get. But you know what I've discovered? I've discovered that my boys, they also aren't going the negative direction. They're also not flying off the rails. They're also not rebellious and talking back and being, so they, there's this vortex in our house. I don't know if you have this. It's right above our trash can. We have a trash can that slides out from the counter. And right above that trash can, there seems to be uh, some type of Star Wars force that causes things to, to, to not be able to pass that point. I don't know what it is. Uh, in fact, I should have brought them today. I have about 40 pictures, no lie, on my phone of things that have just, they, 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 they're too heavy. They don't go, like, you, possibly, you couldn't possibly lift them any further than that. Cereal boxes, milk cartons, wrappers. They just, they, they, I understand, like, our arms are only able to carry so much. And you get to that point and you've just got to drop it. I, I feel for you. I'm so sorry. That, that, that must really hurt. And I don't know what it is. They just stop right there over and over again. And so I go in the kitchen and we have the talk. I'll call them. Hey, boys, come here, come here, come here. Remember, this slides out. It's, I know it's complicated, but you slide it out and then you just, just I, you don't have to lift it. You can just slide it off the counter. It'll fall and gravity will do the rest. Just slide it in there. Let's practice. Come here, come here, come here. Just, you, you, you practice. I'm going to cheer you on. Come on, come on, baby. You can do it. Let's go. Let's go. Good job, good job, good job. I walk in the kitchen the other day. And it had been like four or five cereal boxes. You know, you get to the end of the cereal box, it stays there. I open the trash can, and there's a cereal box <laughs> in the trash can. I threw a party. I called my boys down. Hey, get in here. They, they must have thought I just bought a new car or we won the lottery. Get in here, get in here, get in here. I opened up the trash can. I gave them both a big hug, and I said, you did it. I'm so proud of you. Now, obviously, that's a little facetious, but here's what I've learned. Just speak life into your house and watch what happens. Most people around you are dynamite. Nobody ever lit the fuse. Nobody ever said, hey, there's a lot of good in you. There's a lot of potential in you. You're doing a great job. You may not be where you want to be, but you're not where you were. You may not have it all figured out, but you serve a God that does. More is possible. Speak life quicker. You have a good thought about somebody, don't wait. Text them. Write a thank you note. Call your wife. Call your mom. Call your dad. Say life with your words and you watch what God does when we give him a chance. Last thing is this as we close. James says this. He says, my words reveal what's really going on inside of me. My words reveal what's going on inside of me. Look at what verses 11 and 12 says. It says, can fresh water and salt water both come out of the same, same spring? The, the, an, the obvious answer is, is, is no. You can't get fresh water from a salt water spring, and you can't get salt water from a fresh water spring. Can a fig tree bear olives? Again, the answer is no. A fig tree can only bear figs. Can a grapevine bear figs? No. Grapevines bear grapevines. Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. What is he saying? saying that if you understand how powerful your words are and you set a commitment, you know what, I'm going to use my words to build people, bridge relationships, unity is going to be built out of me by the words that I speak. Here's what you're going to find out, that your words will show your heart. My words show my heart. This is what my words do. 
Jesus said this way, Matthew said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, if your heart, what James is saying, if your heart is full of salt water, your mouth won't speak fresh water. If you have a word problem, if you're sitting here today and you go, Ethan, I've got an area of my life where I need to, I need to clean up my words, I need to fix my words. Maybe it's the words that you're allowing to roll around in your head. Maybe it's the words you're saying over other people. Maybe it's the words you're saying online. You're, you're, you have an area where you go, I need to be more watchful with my words. If you have a word problem, James says you have a bigger problem. You have a heart problem. This is good news and bad news. James says, if there's something going on with your mouth, it's actually going on in your heart. But here's the good news. The good news is, that if you get your heart right, your words will change. You don't have to wrestle with your words the rest of your life. You don't have to grit your teeth and try really hard to bite your tongue and only say good words. If you allow God to do a heart change, your words will automatically change with them. I hate coconut. I, this, is, this is just confession time with Ethan. There, I, if you know me, you know that I have a ranking system for most, most things in my life because I like scoreboards and I like to be competitive. I have a ranking system for foods that I like. Chocolate croissants are on the top of that list. Nothing yet in life has unseated chocolate croissants as the world champion of food in my life. I don't know what your top thing is in your life. I have a, a list of things that I hate as well. I'm not, I'm, I know pastors aren't supposed to hate things. I'm breaking the mold, gang. I'm pioneering some new territory. There's certain things I hate. The silver medalist is snakes. I hate snakes. Snakes are number two, but number one is coconut. I hate coconut with all of my heart. Uh, I, I don't know how people like coconut. It doesn't, you, listen, when you chop coconut up, it's plastic. It doesn't go anywhere. You can chew it and chew it and chew it and chew it. It doesn't go, it doesn't disappear. It's evil. I'm convinced the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden was coconut. God said, don't eat it. They said, let's try it. Listen, have you ever tried to open up a coconut in the wild? Like how God made them? Have you seen Castaway? You can't get inside. You know why you can't get inside? It's because God didn't mean for you to get inside. It was never his intention. My wife loves coconut. Okay? I hate coconut. My wife loves it. My wife will try to trick me. She'll put coconut in stuff. I can see it a mile away. I know if there's coconut in the cookies. Yeah, I get like one little bite in, I go, nope, there's, listen, there's coconut in there. We're gonna need to go see a marriage counselor. This is not gonna work out for us. <laughs> I know, but so my wife will like, um, there are these uh, organic, you know what Almond Joy are, right? They're like, they, 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 they camouflage the coconut with chocolate and almonds and stuff. There's organic ones of those called Ocho. My wife says they're awesome. She has them around the house and she tries to get me to eat one. And on the outside, they look like chocolate. They look great. And then I open it and I'm like, this is, this is the white. At what point did we decide chocolate isn't enough? Let's put poison in there with it. I don't know what point we did that. So I hate coconut. Me and coconut are here. Coconut's there, I'm here. Coconut and I are never gonna get along. I'm never gonna bridge that, ba that gap and be okay with coconut until one day, we're on vacation and I get a sunburn. I get a sunburn and my wife, uh, we, you know, normally we have aloe and that kind of stuff. We didn't have it and we like, for whatever reason, we just, you know, didn't have it with us. So she goes into the pantry and she gets this out. And this is, this is coconut oil. It has a picture of a big picture of coconut on it. And I thought she was joking with me. I said, listen, do, you can't pour, you know, lemon juice on the paper cut here. What are you bringing that? She said, just trust me, just trust me, just trust me. She opened it up and she said, just just reach in there and put some of that in your hand. I said, this is the weirdest thing I've ever done. I'm putting food on a sunburn. I don't know what this, just, just trust me. And if you, if you know this about coconut oil, you know what happens. You get a little bit on your hand, what happens to it? It melts. It's just like liquid. It just, it just goes away. And she said, now rub that on your shoulders. I put it a little bit on my shoulders. Gang, it was life changing. I put it on my shoulders, I put it on my arm. It was like giving a velvet puppy dog a hug. It was just like, <laughs> put more on. I just started, like, I'm telling you guys, like you wanna, you wanna really like, Girl out for a second, like not grill, girl. If you want to girl out, get, 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 get a little bit of this and put it on your face. If your face ever gets dry, oh my gosh, it's the best thing in the world. Me and coconut are best friends now. Like I can't get enough. <laughs> Why? Because the form of coconut went from being just what it is. That's just me. You're going to have to like me or hate me. That's just me. But when coconut came to me in a way that was intentionally healing, everything changed. 
I'm willing to have something in my life that before I was repulsed by because the entire reason that it was in my life was to bring healing. Can I tell you this? The relationships around you, whether you feel like they have a rift or it's just your next door neighbor, your relationships need healing. And the way that we bring unity is with healing words. But I just want you to feel this as we close. Healing words flow from a healed heart. And if you don't have a healed heart, it's going to be difficult for you to flow out a river of living water on people around you to be grace and life, salt to the people around you. It's going to be very difficult. So the place that we start is just by saying, God, would you heal this? And here's my challenge for you this week. Just take an inventory. Here's where you're going to know the places that you're hurt. You're going to feel bitter, antagonistic, upset, impatient about certain things. It might be a certain topic, it might be a certain setting, it might be a certain scenario. Every time we go to do this, I start feeling this, and so my words start reflecting what I'm feeling here. It may have happened this morning. We're getting ready for church. We are out of practice getting ready to go social places in public, and you took forever, and you start to have that feeling in here. If you're starting to have that feeling in here, odds are your words are going to reflect it out here. So... When you start to feel that in here, just pray a very simple prayer. Would you just say, God, would you just, just put some coconut oil on that for me? Would you just, 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 would you just heal that for me so that I can be with my words what I want to be for the people around me? And then here's your homework this week. Some of you, it's going to be just simply letting God heal your heart. Some of you, it's going to be just inviting that and saying, okay, God, I need to let you do something in here. But for all of us, if we're going to be the kind of people that lead the way in unity, I'm just going to challenge you to do this. Would you do, just ask God where you can do this? Would you reconnect the relationship with your words? It might be two people that you know they need to be reconnected. Can I tell you what kind of life it would be to a marriage that's struggling, maybe feeling strained? Maybe it's a friend in your life and you know that their kids and them are, are having a difficult season right now. You know what it means to someone when a friend just walks into their world or calls them and just says, hey, I just wanted you to know, I was praying for you and Sue. I just want you to know I believe in you guys, and I'm in your corner, and I'm backing you up. You know what it would mean to your spouse? You may be sitting next to a person today, and you're shoulder to shoulder, but as the old Poison song goes, we're miles apart inside. Was it something I said or something I did? Did my words not come out right? I'll keep singing if you want. Listen, <laughs> there's a reason why that poison song resonates with so many hearts like mine is those words are very true. It's possible to be living in the same house but feel like you're living different lives. You know what it would mean to that person if you just said, I know things aren't great right now, but I love you. Sorry, I know it's hard. I know this season's difficult, but I like you. I'd still pick you if I had to do it over again. And I don't know how we're gonna walk through this, but if you, if you give me a chance, I'd like to just speak life into this. This last week, as we preached on this, at Broken Arrow, very similar moment in the room where you can feel God working with hearts. I got so many messages on Facebook and text messages after the service. My mom has terminal cancer and we haven't spoken in years and I, I don't even know how to bridge that gap, but I'm going to see her today. My wife and I are hanging on by a thread, in fact, this week we were supposed to file for divorce, but we're gonna sit down and we're gonna talk. I haven't gone to see my son because ever since he got married, we haven't spoken. It's been a real strain on our family because of who he married, but I'm going to see him and I'm going to tell her that she's part of our family now. And I love her. And I don't know all the baggage that exists in this room this morning. But I know this, the same God who spoke the worlds into creation wants to stand in front of you this morning and just say, 
if you understand how big of a partner I am in your world, you wouldn't even hesitate to speak. When you know that the God of the universe backs up your words and you start speaking life over your family, life over your job, life over your kids, God gets involved because he sees people speaking his language and going, they understand me. They get it. They're speaking words of faith into doubt. They're speaking words of life into death, light into darkness, because that's exactly what your God did. And every time you have the faith and the courage to do what he did, he gets involved. So I want to pray for you today. And I just am going to very simply ask God's spirit to lay on your heart the relationships that need to be healed and then give you the strength and the courage to begin to speak life. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for the chance that we've had this morning to be reminded of a very simple truth, but one that maybe carries more power than anything else in our relationships. So God, I ask that as a church first, as an organization of families linking arms together, that this would be a house marked by words of faith, that we would speak words of faith over each other, words of life over over each other, words of life over our community, that this community would never be the same because there's a group of people that said, we, we've got this community's back, we've got our government's back, we've got our mayor's back, we've got our police's back, we've got our law enforcement's back, we've got our city council, we've got our schools back. God, we're going to speak life over them, pray over them. We just speak life right now to Jenks schools and to Glenpool schools, Sepulpa schools, uh, Berry Hill schools. God, we, we uh, uh, key for mouths. God, we speak life into the schools and Sand Springs, everybody on the west and south side of the city, as they're getting ready for the school year, God, we speak wisdom and life over them. God, give them energy and passion. Give them wisdom on how to lead the teachers, how to create safe environments. We believe that the best days are in front of this community, not behind it. God, would this be a house marked by speaking life? And anytime somebody gets around us, they just can't help but turn that life on each other. Instead of devouring each other with our words, God, would we be marked as the kind of people that heal with our words? We may not have it all figured out, but we're gonna speak to potential and not past. God, I just pray over every marriage, every friendship, every parent-child relationship in the room. God, I'm just gonna be obedient this morning and speak life to a parent that feels very misunderstood by their kids. A relationship that's been strained because that child does not get along with you and you don't get along with that child. The personalities are so different. It feels like you're always magnets turned the wrong way, chasing each other away. If that's you this morning, I just, I just want you to know that your Heavenly Father sees you and He cares enough about you in that relationship to stop everything we're doing in the service and say, I see you and I'm doing more than you realize. Would you trust me to speak life into that relationship? And this morning before we run, we all have stuff to do and lunch to go to and, and things, to, things to do. I just, it would be a shame if we talk about a God who heals relationships and not give you an opportunity to heal your relationship with God. If you're here just to stay in an attitude of worship with every head bowed, every eye closed. This is just a moment between you and God. If you say, Ethan, that's me. I, I don't have a great relationship with God. Or you say, I, I, had a, I had a relationship with God, but honestly, I've drifted away. And if you gave me a chance today to restart my relationship with God, I would take it. If that's you, again, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I don't do this to call attention to you or to embarrass you in any way, but just to give you a moment between you and God. If that's you, just write your seat. Would you slip your hand up and put it right back down? You say, Ethan, that's me. I would love to restart my relationship with God this morning. I see that hand. You don't have to put it up far. Just slip it up, put it right back down. I see that hand. Anybody else that would join these say, yeah, that's me. Thank you for your boldness. That's awesome. That's awesome, man. We're cheering you on. We're so proud of you. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray a prayer. We call this prayer our believer's prayer. We pray this to close out our time together. It gives all of us a chance to remember that Jesus is the center of our lives. So we're going to pray this prayer out loud. And if you jump in and pray this prayer with us, God will do what only he can do. He'll forgive your past, give you new hope for a bright future. 
We heal our relationships with our words. And the same goes for our relationship with God. As you pray this prayer, that relationship gets healed, the gap gets closed, and God brings grace. Let's pray this prayer together, loud and bold. Church, say this, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus for me. I believe he died and rose again so that I could have new life. Thank you for meeting me right here and giving me a bright future. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Hey, I told you that was gonna be great and I did not lie. Listen, if, if you felt that tug in your heart that today's the day you need to begin your journey walking with the real Jesus, maybe you prayed that prayer. Maybe you prayed that prayer for the first time in a long time. It's time for you to get going. Listen, I want you to take out your phone and send to the number 23101, the word Glenpool. A little menu will come up there and it'll say, I raised my hand. Follow the prompts there. Just send us enough information so that we can reach out to you and we'll provide you with some resources and some contact. We'll see if we can help make that process rich and valuable to you. Thanks for coming. We look forward to seeing you next time.